Good morning and welcome to this video on classification taxonomy. Today we're going to look at how and why we classify all life on Earth in a particular manner. Firstly, why do we classify? Well, classification puts organisms into groups by looking at characteristics or their traits that they share. What ones they have in common, what ones are different. We've already looked at adaptations and some of those are used to help classify. Other uh, uh, traits that we use are genetic, and we go into a much more finer detail when we're looking at DNA to classify organisms. So here you can see all these things are alive, yet very, very, very different, from macroorganisms like animals and plants to very, very small microscopic organisms um, that we have on our planet. So classifying living things into groups, we base it on their body structure, their anatomy, or their DNA, or other traits. It's very easy to see here that we have, um, you know, a human, and we have all the sea life. They're all animals, but obviously very, very different. Now, at this stage, we can very easily classify based on body structure or anatomy. As we further get down the um, taxa that we'll look at in a second, you see that we have to go into more and more specifics. What is the difference between us and our prehistoric um, neighbours, such as Homo habilis or things like that? But who came up with this idea? How do we name things? Well, it was actually a Swedish botanist. He lived in 1707 to 1778, and he invented the binomial nomenclature, you can't even say the name, um, which is the two-word binomial, bi meaning two, word naming system we use today to classify organisms. And um, Carolus Linnaeus was the father of taxonomy. So I alluded to this word before, the binomial nomenclature, okay, gives us a unique two-word Latin scientific name to all living things. Now, it's interesting that it's Latin. Latin is considered a, a dead language, um, still spoken in the Catholic Church, but other than that, it's not spoken as a living language. Now, that's really important for naming scientific things, because the language will no longer evolve. So those words will need, mean the same thing. With living languages, words evolve, their meanings change, um, slang comes into normal use, and uh, words that we want to use to mean the same thing for a long time can in the future change. So using a language that is no longer dead, and I'm not saying it will never be used again, but it is used for a different use, and that is things like naming organisms. The genus is capitalized, um, which is the first word, and species is not. But both are always in italics, and I haven't done that on my slides, but it's just another little um, finicky detail about naming organisms. So we have Homo sapiens. Homo is the genus, sapiens is the species, and that is us, humans. Okay. We also have the Felis domet uh, domestica <laughs> domesticus, which is a cat, again, Bit of a tongue twisting language, but you know, um, don't panic about pronouncing it as long as you understand the words. Okay, so what are the scientific names of these two animals here? We have our friendly chimp and this amoeba looking thing here. Well, if you look at the previous um, 10 seconds of the video, you need to find the genus and the species. So for our chimpanzee, we have pan and we have troglodytes. So, pan troglodytes is the scientific name for our chimpanzee. And for our amoebae looking single celled organism, we've got the Paramecium chordatum. Okay, Paramecium genus with capital, chordatum species. So, this amoeba looking single celled organism is Paramecium chordatum. It's always quite fun to say Latin as well. Now, there's a reason we use these. Um, to officially name things, and this is one of my favorite examples. What would you call this creature? Wherever you are in the world watching this video, what would you call this creature? Okay, this creature had so many names. Pill bug, roly poly bug, potato bug, slater, wood lice, wood louse. Um, you name it, it's got a, loads of different names depending on where you come from, where you grew up. So that is not the best thing to call this bug. 
we need to have something, a common name, for the same species, otherwise it becomes too confusing for us to try and name them. That's why the binomial nomenclature uses Latin, okay, this dead language that is unchanging. It's also the language that we know all scientists across the world, regardless of where they are, regardless of language, will use. Okay, And the scientific name for this is the armadillidibdum, <laughs> Vulgaire, okay? Armadillo, like sounds like armadillo, probably from um, the uh, sort of look of it, but that is the scientific name. So I've alluded to these and you've seen them in some of the diagrams I've used. These are the taxa of classification. So from top to bottom, each of these is a narrowing um, way of we sort of classify our organisms. So you might have heard of the animal kingdom. So all animals are part of the animal kingdom. No plants are in that kingdom. They're in the plant kingdom. Okay, so once we're in the animal kingdom, all those organisms will have a phylum class, order, family, genus, species. And you go down this list, and the further you go down this list, the more specific and unique you get. Okay? And we focus for our naming of things using the two bottom, genus and species. Okay? So here's another way to look at it. Um, so if we look at the kingdoms as a good example, there's five of those, okay? Now as we go down each of these, we decrease in number in terms of the amount in each group, okay? Until we're left with one species, okay? For us, it's Homo sapiens. We don't have any other um, species in that group, all right? But a couple of hundred thousand years ago, we did have Homo neanderthal, which was part of the Homo genus, so there would have been two groups here. Okay, and then we went further up, and then once we get up here, you start to introduce the sort of chimpanzees family, the um, gorillas, all those other big apes into these. The further we go up, and then we'll all end up in the animal kingdom, but you won't have any plants in there. Okay, they'll be in a different kingdom. All right, so as you go up, you decrease in similarity. So we've got, you know, we're not very similar to an elephant. Okay, but at one point we'll be in one of the same groups as an elephant. Okay. As you go down the groups, you increase in similarity until you're usually left with one species. So species is the smallest, most specific group in the classification. Okay? Organisms in the same species can reproduce together, and their offspring are fertile. Okay? That's what defines a species. Two things that can mate and produce fertile offspring. What that means is the offspring can then mate. Okay? So... A few tools, we've got the phylogeny. This is a sort of a family tree that classifies organisms by their evolution history that we can use our taxa to do. We also have the uh, cladiogram, which if you look here, shows the older traits that all these have in common, things like a vertebrae, and goes up to newer traits um, that go and split and make these more unique. And finally, and what I want you to uh, create yourself in class, is a dichotomous key. Now this helps identify organisms by asking questions. Now each of these questions that it asks have two answers. The two answers will lead you to two choices that lead you to new question which leads you to two, two, two new choices. So you can see here we've got our little lizard. So the first question might be does it have feathers? No it doesn't. Okay well does it have legs? If it didn't we'd have this and it could be a snake. If it did might be yes. Okay, you could add further classification here. Does it have feathers? No. Does it have fur? Well, no. So it goes to this one. All right. Or if it had yes, we might could have cat, dog over here, whatever it is. Okay. So you can make big long trees of dichotomous um, keys. All right. However, there is another way you can do them. Here is a key version, and it's the exact same principle without the branches. You've got these questions here as we go down. And for example, is the we look at the, the organism in question, say this one, we say, is body complete or partially covered in a shell? Well, it's partially covered in a shell, so we go to two. So we've jumped to two down here. Is the shell attached to rocks by thin threads? No. Is the shell attached to rock? Uh, is the shell not attached? Yes, so we go to three. All right, is the shell a spire that comes to a point, or is it not a spire? It is a spire, so it's this organism. So B is this organism, and you put B in here, okay? So, a quick video on classifying organisms, classifying them using taxa. Hope you've enjoyed this video. 
I look forward to answering your questions in class. See you there.